Good afternoon and welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister here in Washington, D.C. Here are your headlines for Tuesday, June 19th, 2012, with global leaders and some in the mainstream media, to be sure, expressing relief that the Greek election results brought about the best case scenario or at least averted a more difficult one. The G20 has reportedly called on Eurozone nations to work closely with the next Greek government to keep it in the single currency. But what does that entail? exactly. What's missing is an accurate analysis of the internal dynamics at play in Greece now as Greek politicians work to form a government will fill in the gaps with the micro picture that affects so majorly the macro picture. And will European leaders allow Greece to renegotiate its bailout terms? Well, different officials are out saying different things, but we'll talk about how that could work when it comes to austerity. You know, that blanket term austerity. Well, it involves actually any number of measures, and some are better than others when it comes to helping or hurting growth. We'll break down the hierarchy. And look who is using the Eurozone to deflect. Europe is a significant event. I'm far more worried about Europe than I am about this trading uh, position. That was Jamie Dimon back on the Hill today before what was touted as a tougher committee. We'll show you the best of and talk about what was missing. Let's get to today's capital account. With the Greek elections taking place this past weekend and Europe the focus of the G20 going on now, we decided to devote a bit more time to the subject of Europe's debt crisis and specifically the case of Greece than other finance shows have. And this is in large part because we feel, for one, the mainstream media produces, well, let's just say a lot of nonsense on the subject. So the next step in Greece is to build a governing coalition, something that will probably take place over the next few days. The Greek general election outcome was in fact kind of the best possible outcome uh, given uh, the expectations. If you don't understand parliamentary democracy, don't worry about it. Just know that we believe somebody might actually be running this country before the end of the week. They could form a government. We feel it our duty to clarify some of what's going on on this show for those who do care how it actually works beyond just, you know, some blanket statements. You know, don't worry about parliamentary de uh, democracy or how it works. You know, we care. It is true that, in part, Greece's problems are reflective of a wider crisis that touches not just its European neighbors, but the entire world. There's a crisis of debt, a crisis of overspending, and of malinvestment going on in the world today. This economic crisis has fueled a political one in countries throughout the world, too. Europe stands as the poster child for this crisis in the developed world, but the United States, with its tremendous trade and current account deficits and its burgeoning public and private debt, is not far behind. But every country is unique, as is every household and every individual. The crisis in Europe has simply acted as a catalytic agent, exacerbating and bringing to light the weakness of the member countries. In Greece, these weaknesses stretch back generations, but in many ways their historical roots remain etched in living memory as Greeks seem caught in a cycle of reliving past moments of national and social import. The dictatorship of the late 60s and early 70s is only one of those periods. There are many others. Greece, of course, is also burdened by a gargantuan public sector and a patronage system that has used elections as a bidding platform for the perks of a government that resembles more a piggy bank than an organ of social progress. Viewed from this perspective, the low voter turnout we saw on Sunday is not just about disillusionment, but also a breakdown in the system of government itself, as parties can no longer offer promises of more carrots, but rather of less sticks. But... Understanding the unique case that is Greece, its government and its people is more than just an academic exercise. It represents a case of study of what happens when government becomes the mechanism for the redistribution, not just of wealth, 
but also privilege in a society whose people are arguably anarchic at their core. It is an exercise in bad governance at its worst, and it has cost the society, and in particular, its youngest citizens, greatly. Those who never had the opportunity to participate in the patronage system, who never had the chance of taking a whack at the public pinata. And that's a broader trend. We see a broader problem that can apply in other countries, too, as I sit in the U.S. Now, earlier I spoke with Emmanuel Skies as policy advisor for ACCA, which is a U.K.-based firm which represents accountants. He's also an author of LOL Greece, which is an economic blog. And here's what he sees as the bigger picture message from all of those dynamics I just described in the last few minutes that have impacted Greeks, Greece's electorate and its latest election results. Well, you see, um, you know, as as governments be get bigger, in a way, the only the, way, the only sustainable way of growing the size of government, because obviously, you know, some countries do manage with very large uh, public sectors, but the only sustainable way to do it is by making sure the public sector remains efficient no matter what. Um, and the point is, there are there are a number of ways in which um, you know inefficient public sectors start. Um, start losing support. Um, you know, for, on the on the one hand, uh, you know, an inefficient public sector will basically lose revenue, and this is something that's happened to Greece quite a bit. So, uh, you know, faced with substantial amounts of corruption, um, taxpayer morale tends to fall. Uh, so your revenues become undermined. Obviously, misdirected public funds mean that there's less public investment, more public mm -hmm. consumption, which in a way in the long term reduces growth rates mm -hmm. uh, and again undermines revenues. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are several ways. In, and, and then there's obviously just um, you know, overspending and excessive, uh, uh, you know, excessive deficits. So there are many ways in which um, an inefficient kind of state undermines itself. But, in the case of Greece, I guess we had um, we had a situation where uh, the state was trying to uh, uh, be everything to, to to all men in a way, and uh, and so you would have things like, for instance, um, very very tough regulation of the labour market, mm -hmm. and at the same time uh, very loose inspection mm -hmm. uh, of mm -hmm. employment. Mm -hmm. So you would have have the worst of both worlds in a way, right. um, and so the the state had uh, the Greek state had many defects that don't fit very neatly into to an um, ideological framework. Mm, uh -huh. uh, you know, another trend that we've seen reflected in Greece is that as things have deteriorated for countries in the Eurozone, we've seen a rise in fringe or extreme parties uh, to the right. Especially in, in France, we've seen uh, growth and support for the National Front, the extreme right. Marine Le Pen came in third in the presidential elections and in the parliamentary elections they just had. They got two seats in parliament, which is the most they've had since 88. In Greece, we've seen that in the rise of the Golden Dawn neo-Nazi party, which for the first time has received enough votes to have seats in parliament. So where do you think this support for neo-Nazis has come from in Greece? Okay. Well, first of all, it's a it's a good thing you draw the distinction because uh, you know Golden Dawn is not your run of the mill uh, far right. Mm -hmm. uh, they are actually properly neo Nazis, which you know is is a massive source of uh, you know shame and anger and this um, in Greece. Mm -hmm. Now, with regards to where they get their support, obviously, you know, not all of their voters uh, are you know. Um, swastika toting neo-Nazis. Um, a lot of them are obviously uh, nationalists, and how and uh, the fact that immigration has been uh, has been exploited on all sides of the political spectrum as a as in a way a piece of political football um, really doesn't help because the anti-immigrant state statements kind of stay with the people even though position, party positions have changed. But also, you know, there is a deep current of nationalism in, in the country uh, that the erstwhile uh, major parties used to basically find ways of accommodating within their ranks. Mm -hmm. So um, I ran through figures, uh, as I recall, of a couple of years ago from the European Survey of, uh, of Values, um, and that was a 2008 survey. Um, to look at, you know, if you take some of um, you know Greek races, uh, who who would they vote for? 
Uh, and in fact, they tended to vote not unlike the rest of the electorate. They, uh, you know, with the exception that none of them were in the uh, were in the left. But uh, you know, they they actually tended to vote in the majority for the socialists at the time. So there are quite a few um, people that you wouldn't expect to harbor that kind of um, sentiment that were previously internalized by the system and have now uh, finally been. Um, been marginalized, and this in terms of both voters and um, and politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but you know, what, what, whatever the reason for it, it is um, you know it is extremely unfortunate mm -hmm. the extent to which the uh, uh, the far right has risen in the polls. I only draw some uh, comfort from the fact that they didn't gain very much. Uh, in the uh, in the last elections, right? And, and you bring up a good point too in your answer, which is that while we have broad trends that maybe you can apply to the eurozone, each country is a unique country. And I feel that what we've seen in the reaction to these election results is that European leaders have kind of said, "Okay, few, this is done with. These are the results we wanted." Also, you see you see uh, news reports applied to the Euro European leaders or eurozone solutions as kind of mon monolithic, not taking into account that these are individual countries that have their own unique political situations, their own unique histories. So on that note, when you're looking and talking about Greece, you say that there are kind of a few major historical uh, things that have happened that really have impacted uh, Greece politically. Can you kind of give us a real brief overview of what those are? Well, I mean, you know, broadly, there's there's four of them. There used to be, um, you know, um, it used to be three. Uh, you know, essentially, there's the civil war, mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, you know, all of uh, 70 years ago. Um, there is the uh, the dictatorship mm -hmm. um, about 30 years ago, and uh, no, 40 actually. Um, and then there's what we what we still call the change, which was basically the uh, um, the coming into power of the socialists the first time around in 1981, when arguably they probably were socialists, um, which, uh, you know, these three events up until, you know, two or three years ago were the major milestones in, uh, in modern uh, Greek political history, at least in people's living memory. Um, and then, of course, added to that, you have uh, now the uh, bailout and the uh, memorandum. Um, but the, the point is, you know, you, you, a lot of this stuff still influences today's politics. And I remember, I remember being told this story where, um, in the student election count, basically for the student elections in uh, Athens in law school, you would have two rival leftist factions kind of taunting each other with. Uh, um, with chants about the disarmament of the guerrillas after the civil war, mm -hmm. and these were these were people in their twenties. So, you know, a lot of the a lot of the rhetoric and a lot of the bad blood in Greek politics is actually very very old. We'll have more with Emmanuel Skizis after the break. Also, still ahead. Jamie Dimon goes to Washington again. Mr. Dimon was on the Hill today. We'll give you our three cents on what came about this time around. But first, your closing market numbers. Drives the world. The fear mongering used by politicians. Who makes decisions? Considerable breakthrough has already been made. Who can you trust? No one who is imbued with a global missionary zeal. Where are we heading? State controlled capitalism is called fascism. When nobody dares to ask, we do. RT question more. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture.
Welcome to the Alona Show, where you'll get the real headlines with none of the mercy. The problem with the mainstream media today is that they're completely disconnected from the viewers and from what actually matters to those viewers. And so that's why young people just don't watch TV anymore. If they want news, they go online and read it. But we're trying to take those stories that people actually care about and transfer them back to TV. Welcome back. Given the historical significance of a few major events in Greece that inform politics and the electorate today that our guest was talking about before the break, I asked him, Emmanuel Skizas, about a debate going on on whether Syriza, which has been dubbed the radical left party that came in second in the elections on Sunday, is trying to recreate that dynamic of change that the country saw in 1981. Here's what he said. Well, that's that's what a lot of their uh, detractors claim, and you know it is true that they have attracted a lot of the uh, of the same profile, I guess, of uh, of voter that flocked to the socialists back in back in eighty one, um, and uh, you know the the kind of um, dilemma that they see for for voters in in many ways. Uh, um, has to do with, uh, you know, the establishment of the privileged versus change for the dispossessed. And I guess that, in that sense, they have kind of tapped into uh, a truly similar trend. So uh, uh, the fact that there is a large part of, of Greek society that feels disenfranchised, that's been locked out of the labor market, it's been uh, locked out of, uh, let's say, aspirational employment or wealth creation or whatever. So, uh, you know, there are some analogies, and obviously they're tapping into that sentiment. Whether they're doing so intentionally um, is very hard to say. Right. But, uh, you know, it is part of that trend is part of their success. Interesting. And there is a divide, too, and you just kind of alluded to it, often in countries, between young and old. It's something that... Uh, brings to mind for, for me the Arab Spring, where you, you uh, kind of think of it in terms of young Egyptians hitting the streets to protest for change, uh, largely at least uh, beginning in that movement. Uh, how does this inform the dynamic in Greece with the electorate and the results of these elections? Well, I, I'll start with a, with a, uh, a pragmatological note there, because uh, you know, what counts as young and old in different countries can vary quite a bit. Absolutely. I, um, very, very recently, Eurostat ran a survey of um, attitudes towards aging, and they found that the average age at, the, at which Greeks feel that a person ceases to be old uh, is 50 and a half, which is, uh, which is a fantastic kind of, uh, a fantastic tourist ad, you know, where would you rather go swimming topless, um, place where people <laughs> think you're old at 38 or a place where people think you're old at 50. But, um, you know, the, the, the point is, though, that, yes, you're right. Um, you know, if you're, let's say, if you're, if you're younger than 30 in, mm -hmm. in Greece, um, you know, you had nothing to do with bringing, uh, you know, the two, two major power. You probably had nothing to do with the building of, uh, of the uh, clientelist networks and armies that they um, relied on. You were too young to be part of them by you know, by the looks of it, you were mostly, you've been mostly regulated out of the, um, of the labor market, essentially. Um, so, you know, it, it, is, it is hard to understand. And adding to that, the fact that, you know, all the voters are worried about um, an exit from the Eurozone in terms of, uh, or a default in terms of uh, whether their savings will be safe. Mm -hmm. um, um, or whether you know their jobs will be secure. Mm -hmm. uh, younger people don't have jobs; <laughs> they don't have savings, right. um, and obviously that creates a very different set of priorities for them mm -hmm. uh, in in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, of their vote. Uh, and that's where you get this dilemma between this false dilemma, really, uh, uh, between uh, hope and fear. Um, actually, the truth is, uh, you know, the two the two sides fear very different things. Mm -hmm. uh, there isn't a great deal of hope to go around in the country, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's interesting. And also, you know, one thing that 
that of course is coming out is is different reports about whether or not European leaders will renegotiate with Greece some of the terms of the memorandum. It's something that political leaders in Greece said that they believe will happen. It's something that uh, Merkel says no Greece needs to stick to austerity, the austerity that we've prescribed. Some other officials have made it sound like Greece might have some wiggle room at least with time. Real quickly, where do you stand with that? And then I want to follow up with a with a bigger question. Of course. Um, well, I think it would be foolish. Uh, let's let's start with the um, you know with the minimum level of renegotiation that mm -hmm. uh, that our creditors could stand for. Um, you know, they could always say, and and some officials have said that Greece can uh, you know can change the mix of measures if they want, mm -hmm. as long as uh, the fiscal result of these measures is the same. Uh, and that does give us some leeway, even in the eyes of, uh, you know, the more hawkish kind of uh, creditors. So if you look at what um, of the research the IMF has been publishing, mm -hmm. uh, it's very clear in the minds, at least of their researchers, I don't know what their policy people are thinking, but their researchers are very clear on the fact that some brands of austerity are better than others. Well, I so think I want to stop you right there for a second because I think that's a really interesting point. You know, especially in the media, austerity is branded as just this one blanket term without acknowledging that there are different types of measures that constitute austerity and some may be better or worse when it comes to allowing growth or stymieing growth. So what would be the kind of better austerity measures that, that a country could adopt or that Greece should renegotiate and try to... Uh, swap in, I guess, for others. I guess there's two major divides along along which we can uh, uh, we can start thinking. The first one has to do with consumption versus investment. So right now, if you look at Greece's public investment program, it's actually been completely devastated. It's been it's been cut out of existence. Uh, there's no reason for that. Actually, you know, public investment, um, you know, the fiscal multiplier for it is much higher than public consumption. Uh, so regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, uh, you can always swap cuts to public um, investment for, for equivalent cuts to public consumption. The result on growth is actually positive. Mm. And your creditors are secure that, um, you know, the, the result in fiscal terms is at least neutral. Similarly, um, there, there's a difference between austerity pursued through tax, there's a difference between austerity, austerity um, uh, pursued through spending cuts. Uh, tax almost always delivers uh, lower levels of growth within taxation strategies. Uh, relying, for instance, on indirect taxes tends to have a much more um, negative effect on growth than relying on direct taxes. Mm -hmm. um, so there are there are ways of mining measures or of um, changing the priority and the weight of the adjustment program. That's it. Emmanuel Skizis debunking the monolithic usage of austerity as a blanket term. We'll see how that plays out for the case of Greece. His analysis there. He's author of the LOL Greece blog. Let's wrap up with Loose Change, Dimitri, Shannon, stop your dancing you were doing during the bumper and tell me what you think of this. Jamie Dimon was on the Hill today. Again, remember he was there last week before the Senate. Today he was before the House Financial Services Committee. They were doing the question asking. Let's see a little of how it went. No, we're not too big to fail. We, we believe that a bank should be bankruptable uh, and that when a bank fails, that the clawbacks will be invoked. Mr. Anyway. Diamond, you said there are going to be clawbacks for people responsible. Is your compensation in the pot that's going to be considered for that? But I also said there will be solidly profitable this quarter, so relative to earnings. That's not the question. Mr. Diamond, please don't fill us here. When you gamble on average, you lose. The house wins. That's been my experience with investing. <laughs> Booyah! Take that!
congressman. So my take on this was last week was a complete and utter failure where just it, everyone seemed to be lavishing praise on Jamie Dimon. A few detractors, but just kind of fake detractors the way they came off in my view. This was just a marginally less of the ass kissing we saw last week. Barney Frank <laughs> being one of the kind of main highlights of giving Jamie Dryman a little more trouble. No, he wasn't. That's, the, Barney Frank's a joke. You want to talk about ass kissing, Barney Frank is the king ass kisser. What I thought was really funny, though, was where Jamie Dimon was like, the house always wins. Bam. Bang. The house <laughs> wins, buddy. Who's the house me? The house of Morgan. I win. Yeah. You guys are suckers for being investors. Guess what? My job is to steal your money. I'm a kleptocrat. That's my job. Sorry. See you later. Sayonara. Yeah. Well, I mean, it stands in contrast to his claim that too big to fail doesn't exist, that there is no too big to fail. Well, he's so big that he can say that this is ridiculous. This is a joke, okay? And Barney Frank's a joke, and he's going to go throw another party in Georgetown. I've heard about his big parties. Never been to one, but Barney, you want to invite me? I've heard they're a lot of fun. If you do invite me, maybe we'll, you know, have more positive coverage on the show. We don't work that way. Who said that? I didn't. I, I, I was just making a joke, but Barney, wink, nod. You know, if you Dimitri, can. Dimitri, Shannon, bring some order into this conversation. The only thing I was glad is that Jamie Dimon did not wear the presidential cufflinks that I could see. Interesting. Right, he didn't, okay, but then he was like, point. the house always wins, buddy, so I take your money. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> Put those presidential cufflinks back on. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on because we have the solution for Jamie Dimon. We have the answer to the easy treatment he gets on the Hill. Check out our YouTube friend RGB Anarchy's latest video. Here it is. Look who that is. It's Lloyd Blank, find Jamie Dimon's friend, and Dimitri bringing in someone else with the big guns, who is none other than Zeus. <laughs> okay, so some Greek throwbacks here, and Zeus really socks it to Lloyd Blankfein once and for all. So Dimitri doing his part. I'm to, really proud. I'm really proud to, to be involved. Fight in, against the bankers. I'm proud to have been involved in the takedown of Jamie Dimon. And also later in that video, they take off Paul Krugman. The aliens take him out. Because he thought that the aliens were gonna actually save us with his whole like plan about, you know, if they're aliens are gonna invade, we're gonna do some crazy, you know, uh, spending policy. Well, they took out Paul Krugman, they took out his crazy ideas. So I wanna know I'm when I'm gonna that. when I'm gonna take out someone. Dimitri. <laughs> You can't take anybody out, Lauren. Why You're is too that? soft. You're too soft. I'm too soft. You're too soft. The reality you, is, you try to act Shannon tough. Shannon has something but to we say. Know you, go ahead, Shannon. Lauren, you may think that Lauren's too soft, but you had to have Zeus step in. Just I didn't so. have to have Zeus step in. That's true. What I did was I let my pit bull do the talking. No, okay, you I need let, somebody I let Zeus else off the leash. To do your okay? dirty work. You see the difference? If I took Dimitri. off the gloves, it wouldn't have even been. A, it would have been a slaughter fest. Remember what I said RGB last time that. about Love wrapping the show? Remember what I said last time? It doesn't move the end of the show. Okay. Shoot. You have Zeus do your bidding. That's where we'll leave you. Thank you so much for watching, and do not forget to come back tomorrow. In the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Lauren Lister. Give us feedback on the show or catch any you missed at youtube.com slash capital account. Thanks for watching, and have a great night.